In this video, I want to touch on a couple of tips to help you with getting organized. The more organized you are now, the more time you're going to save in looking for those misplaced files. That can quickly add up and save time, and time is money. If you already have a system in place, then these tips may give you an idea or two, or at worst, let you know that your current system is the best one for you, and hey, there's no need to fix what ain't broke, right? As you grow your business, you may have to make certain adjustments in your organizational habits, but at least ways you'll have something to adjust. The idea here is to just do it. Begin getting organized now, and as needed, make your changes. For example, I have a certain folder structure to keep all of my website and domain details organized. Let's go ahead and take a look at what I've got set up here. One of the folders on my hard drive is called My Sites. And inside of that folder, I've got a list of every single domain that I have in their own individual folders. For example, domain X would be site-x. Domain Y would be site-y, and so on. And inside of each one of these folders, at a bare minimum, I have two more folders and then a text document that contains all the login and additional details about that domain. Now, since most all of my websites are database-driven WordPress sites, my structure might be a little bit different than what you might need. But at least ways, this will give you an idea to work with. But I've got two folders here, one named Images and one named Backup. That should be no different than your setup. You should always have a backup, whether your websites or WordPress sites or Joomla sites or just static HTML sites. You should always have at least a most recent backup and at least one prior backup. You may find the need to have more than just one prior backup, but at the very minimum, have two backups in there, the most recent and the one prior. And in my backup folder here, I've got two more folders, one called database, one called files. And since my sites are a majority of WordPress sites, I have the need for a database folder you may not so again that's totally up to you but you should at the very least have one that says backup and i've got a folder here for images any and all images aren't going to be scattered about in this folder for this domain name they're all going to be stuck in here and after a while i may have those images organized inside of this folder to the point where i might have all of my photoshop or psd images in its own folder inside of here I might have all of my sales page images in its own folder inside of here, and so on. Now, this guy right here, this is kind of the heart of my organized files. Open this guy up, and remember, most all of my websites are WordPress sites. And of the web hosting companies that I use now, a majority of them have cPanel as the control panel. And that's why I've got this guy right here. If your control panel is something other than cPanel, then just replace this with yours. Maybe it's Plesk or something else. But for the most part, your control panel login details and your FTP login details will be the same. With the minor exception that sometimes the prefix to your FTP might be FTP dot your domain name. Or for a secure login, it might be SFTP dot your domain name. But you're always going to have a username and a password. And I've got a section up here that contains notes for my domain. Again, since most of my sites are WordPress sites, these notes here are referencing a configuration file for my WordPress site. Just a little add-on that I want to put in there. And I've got the username and the password for my administrator login details for my blogs and the database information for my blogs and my email addresses for that particular domain as well as a Gmail account that I've got set up for that domain. Now I've got this set up in addition to my email accounts for that domain because by having a Gmail account, this gives me access to Google tools for this specific domain. And since Gmail is free, why not? Along with that, I've got a separate YouTube account for just that domain and anything else that I might need for, that, for just that domain, I have those in here as well. Again, use this as a guide to go by. You may have a lot more in your file. You may have a lot less. But again, it's something to begin with. It's something to start off with. Now, you're also going to need a way to keep your online purchases organized. First off, for me, I write down, yes, actual pen and paper, all of my online purchases. So every evening before I head to bed, I can review those must-have purchases that have never been used yet and see if I can or need to work them into my upcoming schedule. Also, I use RoboForm to keep track of all of my passwords for the products that are purchased, for the products that are protected within a membership site, 
and I have a folder structure on my computer for all my purchases. Let's take a look at that. Let's go ahead and back up here. And like the folder that I have on my hard drive that says My Sites that have all these guys in there, I've got another one named Online Purchases. And you can name yours whatever you want. Again, this is just to be used as a guide to go by. And inside of here, I've got several different folders. In this case, these are niches or topics. I might have a purchase on the Warrior Forum, one of the WSOs or Warrior Special Offers. And I might have a separate folder here just titled WSOs where I might have all of those located. And inside of there, I might have the name of the purchase preceded by the date so that I can organize it by date purchased or the name of the person that created the product. Again, totally up to you, however you're most comfortable in keeping your stuff organized. For me, since I'm a product creator, I tend to have things more niche related. So if I purchase something off of the Warrior Forum or from JVZoo or just off the website in general, and it's niche related to AdWords or CPA or Kindle or LinkedIn, then I will put that purchase information in here. I will create a new folder just for that purchase information and I will stick it in here and I'll date it and put whatever other information I need that will allow me to quickly locate it. Because in Windows Explorer, I've got this little search option up here so that any keyword related to that particular purchase, I can then use later on in the search function up here in Windows Explorer that will allow me to more quickly locate that particular product or that particular purchase. I should also mention that no matter how organized your files are, if they're not backed up somewhere, then you're taking the chance of losing everything. Now at the very least, you should save your can't live without files somewhere outside of your computer, like on a thumb drive or an external hard drive. And these hard drives or thumb drives are so cheap nowadays, you're really doing yourself a disservice by not doing this, by not spending a little bit of extra money now so that you're not going to have to spend a whole lot of money and, and heartache later on if something bad happens to your files. Now, if you can afford it, you can get a couple of hard drives for inside your computer, similar to my setup. As you can see over here on the left panel, I've got the C drive. That's the default drive that came with the computer. And I purchased two additional hard drives, one that contains most all of my work and one that is specifically set up for backups. And I try to keep just the program installations on my C drive. That allows it to load faster. And all of my work and purchase downloads go into my H drive, with the exception of those guys that are downloaded to my documents or the download folders here. At which point, if need be, I will then either delete them from this or move them into one of my folders on my H drive so I can keep these guys as clean as possible. A lot of other folks do just the opposite. They'll pack up their C drive with all the same information because they don't have an additional hard drive. Again, it's totally up to you, personal preference. My main point here is to have a backup set up somewhere. Now, in closing, I want to mention that my folder structure examples and the use of Notepad works great for me. You may be fluent in using spreadsheet or mind mapping type programs, in which case you could put all the details of your domain and website files on a spreadsheet or on a mind map, and they would work 10 times better for you than in my examples. However you do it, just do it. Well, this should give you a good starting point for your own organizing structure. Remember, this is not meant to be a perfect solution, but something that can be adjusted as your business and ideas grow and change. Thank you very much for watching, and you have a great day. What is FTP? Well, FTP is short for File Transfer Protocol. And as we can see here, there's a whole lot of information here about File Transfer Protocol. Now, if you're familiar with working on the internet at all, you're more than likely familiar with a different protocol, and that's the HTTP. But we're talking about File Transfer Protocol in this case. And just kind of scrolling through this, there's a lot of information in here. And I got to tell you, 99% of it, most of us will never ever need to know. Look at it like this. FTP is like a bridge between your computer and your website on the internet. Now on one side of that bridge is the server where your website is. The other end of that bridge is your computer or what's also called the client side of that bridge. Now there are lots of programs or software that can be used to transfer the files across that bridge. Now some of those programs or software are free and some are not. But you really need not look any further than your own internet browser, you know, like Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer, or Firefox to kind of test out this 
FTP software. Sticking with this bridge analogy, the browser method is just a one-way bridge. In other words, in most cases, you can connect to the server but can only download from the server to your computer. You cannot upload from your computer to the server. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm in the Chrome browser right now and let me toss in a website here that by the way, I do not own because for you to really have true access, that two-way traffic that I'm talking about, where you can upload and download to the server, you have to own or have permissions to that server. And I'm going to be demonstrating this using, in the first case, the Adobe website. You know, the fine folks that bring us Photoshop and Adobe Acrobat and all that stuff. Just type in FTP colon slash slash adobe.com or as in this case I also put that ftp.adobe.com sometimes you need the FTP in there sometimes you don't but to use your browser you have to have the prefix FTP colon slash slash and as you can see I'm in the index of the adobe.com website and I have access to these files here but I do not have access to upload to their server now in order for you to own and have that two-way connection, meaning being able to both upload and download from the server, you're going to need a username and password to that server. That username and password is sent to you when you purchase a web hosting package from a company like HostGator, HostMonster, Lunar Pages, or Bluehost, or, or actually there are a ton of hosting companies to choose from, but hey, that is a video for another day. Another FTP tool is your own computer's Windows Explorer. That is, of course, if you're using a Windows operating system and you have already purchased that web hosting package I mentioned and received your username and password. Just open up your Windows Explorer and in the address bar, here, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Right up here in the address bar, you just want to type in FTP colon slash slash so far, that's the same as it was when we used the browser tool. But now you want to type in the username that you have received after purchasing your web hosting package, the at symbol, and then the domain.com, kind of like this. And again, this is the username that you received from your web hosting package, and then the domain name. And then you simply hit the enter key or that arrow, and it will then open up a box asking for your username and password. Again, that was sent to you from the web hosting company. Then you have that two-way access where you can both download from your server and upload to your server just by simply dragging a file from your computer into this area here it will automatically be uploaded to your server or you can drag the file from this area here which is your server online and drag it to wherever you want it to be downloaded to on your computer. Now, using your Windows Explorer as an FTP tool has one major downside, and this is the deal breaker for me. It is as slow as cold molasses. And if you aren't familiar with how slow cold molasses is, just take it from me, it's super duper slow. Now, the more popular FTP tools or client programs, as they're also called, are like Smart FTP or Acute FTP or the very powerful and free FileZilla. But remember, no matter which FTP tool you decide to use, you're going to need to purchase web hosting and you're going to need a domain name. Sometimes those domain names come with the web hosting package you purchased, you just got to do a little bit of shopping around. But as I mentioned earlier, that's a video for another day. This is going to bring us to an end to this video on what is FTP. Thanks for watching and you have a great day. In order for you to have and build on a website, you're going to need at least two things. You're going to need web hosting and you'll need a domain name. Now the domain name can be the trickiest of these two because it requires you to do a little research and even after you do the research to figure out what you want for your domain name, it may no longer be available. Like fingerprints, there are no two domain names exactly alike. So if someone else bought the name you wanted, you're just out of luck. Of course, you could try and purchase the domain name from the current owner, but that really works out in your favor without costing you an arm and a leg. For me, though, I try for a domain name that was very close to the original one that I wanted. For example, if I wanted applerecipe.com and it was already taken, which, by the way, it is, then I'd try, say, best or thebestapplerecipe.com or even throw on a suffix, maybe apple recipe winners or specific type of apple recipe like crab apple recipe. Again, use your imagination there. As a matter of fact, that's what we're going to be doing now is checking into some tools that will help us with locating the perfect 
domain for our website. The first tool, and by the way, these are by all means not all the tools available out there. These are just some that I've had some personal experience with. And something else too, even though some of these tools may offer the option of purchasing the domain name right there from their site, hold off on that. I've got some additional tools for you later on in this video for purchasing the domain names. But the first one is psychicwhois.com. Just type in the name that you're wanting and as you're typing it will give you some suggestions as well as when you're done typing it'll tell you if the one you want is already taken or not. For example, Apple Recipe, as you can see here, the red guys, you got it. That means they're already gone. AppleRecipe.com, .net, .org, and .us are already taken. But you've got some additional options here that Psychic Who Is tells you is or is not already available. And by the way, unless you think otherwise, I would suggest sticking with just the .com for your domain names because that's the most popular right now anyway. And they're looking at adding additional extensions as time rolls on. So there's going to be some pretty funky ones out there like .money and there's a lot more that are in the works. So for the time being though, .com is the most popular and that's one that I would be looking for. So that's Psychic Who Is, and you'll find that a lot of these tools are pretty much the same. Now, Bust Name is a little more extensive. You can put in some keywords here, and it will do a lot of the research for you. And without spending a whole lot of time on this site, I'm just going to point you over to their video tutorials. And I would definitely check out Bust a Name, bookmark it, and use it. A cool tool is DomainsBot. Dot com. Like with Psychic Who Is, you just type in the name here, and it'll start spitting out some suggestions. But they've got some additional tools over here on the left that'll help you out even further too. Synonyms, prefixes, suffixes, I mean all kinds of cool stuff. And you can see right here what is and what is not available. Domain Typer is another fun one. You can find that at DomainTyper.com. It'll also spit out some of those funky extensions I was talking about earlier, like AppleRecipe.pi. Again, I would stay away from these. I would simply stick with the .coms for, for the time being. And these big bright red boxes, guess what? That means that particular extension is already taken. But if you want to find out more about it, you've got the ability to check out the site, the who is, meaning who owns it currently, and possibly th throw them a line and see if they might consider you know, working out a deal with you. You can see how popular that current site is. That might give you an idea as to how much money they're going to be wanting for it if it's really popular, and so on. And another one here is Moniker. That's at Moniker.com. It too has a whole lot of tools working with it. So add this to your bookmarks as well. Another great tool is Noam.com. Because one thing you should be looking at is brand recognition for your website. One of the most powerful ways to brand yourself or website is through social media. Plus, once you've established a connection or created an account on the social media sites that will complement your website and services, then you stand a greater chance of tapping into all that free traffic from these sites as well as the search engine loving backlinks from these social sites to your website. Win, win, win. Noam.com is a site that can help establish a brand continuity with over 600 different social media sites. Once you've signed up for your free account, you can then check if your username is being used on any of the 600 social media sites that Noam.com monitors. This way, you'll have a better idea if one of the domain names you are wanting has already been used in a lot of these social media sites. Now you can make a more informed choice as to which domains to go with or to kick off your list. And they've got plenty of tutorials online here as far as how to go about establishing these connections. So by all means, check out Noam.com. Now as far as the actual purchasing of your domain name, my first suggestion would be name silo mainly because of the price. It's not feature rich, but it is definitely fantastic as far as the price. It's one of the best ones you're going to find out there. There's no hidden fees. And it's $8.99 a year, and that's it. You can even get some discounts on there as well. But if you, for example, were to purchase your domain name from GoDaddy whenever they've got one of their sales going on, and you can get a, a .com, because again, you really only want to look for .coms. There may be reasons for you to look for other extensions, but I'm suggesting .com. But if you get a .com for, say, $0.99 cents for the first year, Go ahead and purchase it through GoDaddy or you know whatever. And then after, say, 60 days or so, go ahead and transfer it over to a name silo.com. And that way you're just getting an additional year added on to the year that GoDaddy gave you 
for whatever cost this is. And I at the time of this recording, it's $8.99. So for $8.99 from Name Silo and the $0.99 cents you purchased it from, again, using this as an example, GoDaddy, you've now got two years paid for on your domain name, and it's now located at Name Silo. Again, it doesn't have a whole lot of features, but if features are what you're looking for and a great price, Namecheap is your company because Namecheap is great. Their prices just went up recently. It's a little over 10 bucks for a year, but they've also got some additional great services that NameSilo does not. For example, free SSL certificates for the first year. After that, they're really inexpensive too. But even then, you may want to hold off on buying a domain name until you check into web hosting because some web hosting companies will offer a free domain name if you purchase a package through them. But web hosting is a video for another day. For the time being though, this is going to bring us to an end on this video on domain names. Thanks for watching and you have a great day. In order for you to own and build on a website, you're going to need at least a couple of things. You'll need a domain name, you'll need a tool to get or transfer files from your computer to your website and from your website to your computer, and you're going to need what is called web hosting. Web hosting is what allows individuals and organizations to make their websites accessible to others via the interweb, otherwise known as the World Wide Web. You can see that when you do a Google search here for web hosting, you're going to get over 500 million results popping back at you. So you can see there's no shortage of options to choose from. This video will help you in your search. While it is possible for you, the individual, to have your own hosting service on your own computer at your own home connected to the internet, uh, that's not what I'm going to be talking about in this video because 99.9% .9 of you will be purchasing web hosting from a company that specializes in hosting websites. You know, kind of like your host gators or dream host or one of the other bazillion web hosting companies out there. Now, I'm a huge do-it-yourselfer, but hosting sites on my own computer, not so much. Now, before you purchase what you need, you should think a little bit about what you want. What is your end goal here for your website? Now, I know that there will be some changes as your site evolves, but in order for you to get started in the right direction, you should at least have a bit of a plan laid out first. For example, ask yourself these questions and grab your pen and paper and write them down. What is my budget for getting things started? How long will that budget last without any income? Will I need a bunch of traffic just to break even? Will I sell things? And if so, what can I sell? Digital goods, physical goods, or both? Will you be hosting large file downloads? Will you have videos on your site? Will I need a secure connection in order to accept credit cards? These are just some of the questions you should write down and refer back to as you do the research for the hosting service you're looking for. Now, I want to first off point out a good resource to go to and a bookmark, and that's our buddies over at Wikipedia. Just do a search there for web hosting service, and you'll end up over here. And if we scroll down a tad bit, and under types of hosting, these guys give a great demonstration of each type of possible web hosting you'd be interested in. From the free that I would highly recommend not getting into, to the shared which is the most popular and a great way to start things out. Next up would be the reseller web hosting, virtual dedicated server or the VPS, virtual private server, dedicated hosting, and they give you a bit of a comparison between each of these. And this kind of starts off with the least expensive, that being free, and goes up to the most expensive, which is the co-location. Now, cloud hosting is kind of sort of one of the newer guys, and this is ideal for a lot of reasons, but it has a couple of drawbacks that may be deal breakers for you. So by all means, check into these as possible options. Now, one of the more popular services out there is called HostGator. I use HostGator. Actually, I use four different web hosting services, but that's information for a different video. But for the time being, I wanted to point out right here, big, bold letters, unlimited. Don't let this be the carrot that brings you into buying their particular service. Nothing against HostGator, because if we check out another popular service, one that I use, they use that word quite a bit too. Unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, unlimited database. Well, the thing is, though, is that unlimited is not so unlimited. Whenever your site reaches a certain amount of resources being used or bandwidth being used, your site is going to get shut down, plain and simple. So don't let this be the only thing that draws you into buying their service. I don't want to say anything bad about HostGator or any of the other hosting services out there because they all do that. I just want to bring it to your attention that unlimited does not mean unlimited. Now, one thing too you want to know is that even though you've been with a particular service for a long time, whether it's several months or several years, 
if you come to the point where you've either outgrown that particular service or you had several instances where you're not liking their customer support, don't think that you're chained down to that service just because they're watching your websites. No, you can always transfer to another one. Just as they say here at D9, and this is one of the things that I use them for, to actually transfer my reseller account from HostGator, I've got an individual hatchling plan with them now, but I had a reseller account with them and I had like 25, 26 different sites hosted on that reseller account. I moved them all over to D9 and they did it all for me. So it was like nothing that I had to do except for give them some names and some emails and bing, bang, boom, they did all the heavy lifting for me and it was totally free. So just know that you're not chained down to a particular service if you find that their support or whatever reason you feel you should move, go ahead and move. Now, Rackspace has been around for quite a while and there, one of their specialties is that cloud server that I was referring to earlier. The major plus to this is that the traffic spikes that you might encounter and that would get your site shut down on a D9 or a HostGator or a DreamHost or a Bluehost on a cloud server, not so much because the cloud server uses the resources of many different servers, whereas other servers, the VPSs or the dedicated or the shared, they're using one server. And whether it's dedicated or shared, whenever your website hits that particular spike, boom, you're shut down. These guys, whenever you hit that particular spike, they share those resources out over other servers. So you never really experience a spike. You never get shut down as a result of using excessive resources. The drawback to a cloud type server is that they are being shared over several different servers. So if privacy is a big issue to you in that respect, I mean, they say that everything's secure, but comparing that to a dedicated server, which is on one physical location and on a cloud server, it's over the course of several different physical locations. If that's the deal breaker for you, well, you should consider that in deciding on if you're going to move everything to the cloud or not. A couple of tools I want to mention here. Uptime Robot at UptimeRobot.com. Totally free. And this is a service that will monitor and alert you when your site or sites are down. They'll send you an email or a text message. And if it happens enough times, you might want to consider that as a way of saying bye-bye HostGator or bye-bye DreamHost. Another neat tool is if you come across a site that loads super fast and you visit it regularly and you never see that it's down and you want to see who their hosting service is, this is the site you want to check out. Whoishostingthis.com. Just put in their website here and it'll give you all those details. Hopefully this video will answer a lot of those questions that you wrote down earlier in helping you determine which hosting service or which hosting package and service is best for you. That's going to bring us to the end of this video on web hosting. Thank you very much for watching and you have a great day. There are tons of FTP programs, both free and premium, or otherwise known as paid programs. In the category of free FTP client programs, there's one that stands out and above the crowd. It's called FileZilla. This video is going to cover the downloading and basic installation of FileZilla. Now, technically, FileZilla is a donationware type of software, meaning you can use it for free all you want, but the creators would very much like for you to donate some money to them if you like using the program. Now, not only is this great karma for you, but it also helps provide money for future updates and support. So, without further ado, let's head on over to the FileZilla website to get our software. And we're looking for FileZilla-Project.org. And you're going to end up at a page like this, and you've got a couple of options here, well, a couple of major options. That's the client or the server. Now, when talking about file transfer protocol, or FTP, there are two ends of the transfer process. The server end, where the files are on the internet, and the client end, where the files are on our computer. So most all of us will only need the client portion of the FileZilla software. So we first off want to just check out the clients. We want to click on that. Oh, and by the way, you may want to bookmark this page here. That way you can refer back to this to cover anything that I may not cover or skim over in this video. Let's go ahead and head over to the client. As you saw there, it covers all platforms. Now we want to decide on which platform we have. And of course, that's something that you'll have to answer for yourself. My operating system is Windows. And if something says recommended, that's the one you probably want to go with. More times than not anyway. Now, if you're using a Macintosh operating system, then you've got these options to choose from here. But I'm, or Linux, don't want to leave you guys out of the picture. But I'm going to go with this guy here because that's the one that's recommended. 
Go ahead and click on that and get their advertising stuff out of the way. Now I've got it set up on my system to download all my downloads to my downloads directory on my computer. You may have yours set up some other way, but that's just how mine is set up. The executable file here has a parentheses and the one there because I've already got this particular file in my system. Right here, along with a lot of other older ones. Yeah, I've been using this for a while. So let's go ahead and skip this because I've already got it downloaded right here, but you get the idea on downloading it anyway. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that out. Let's head on over to my downloads folder. Okay, so here's my downloads. Come on down here to this guy here. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to run as administrator. This guy pops up and you may get a different type of message depending upon, you know, your operating system. I'm using Windows 7. Click on yes. And then I get this guy to pop up. Click on Agree. Of course, you want to read all this fancy stuff first, but click on Agree. And anyone who uses this computer, that's totally up to you, however you want to do this. Click on Next. And I just go with the default settings. That's always fine for me. Now let's go ahead and throw a desktop icon on there. As you can see, as we hover over these, it gives you a little description over here. So if you're not sure about it, just untick it. But this all looks good to me. And click on Next. And unless you know what you're doing I would leave it as is as far as the default location of the destination folder click on next and click on next and it's installing away and let's go ahead and start that guy and here we are that's how simple it is to download and install your FileZilla FTP software now in closing I want to say that when there is an update to FileZilla this is one of the cool things I like about this besides the fact you, you can't beat the price is that when you open up your client software and there is a new version of FileZilla, you're going to be given the option to update instantly or you can manually update later. Totally up to you. I just do the instant because it takes less than a minute and I'm back to work with an updated program. Simple assignment. That is the end of this video on downloading and installing the FileZilla FTP software. Thanks for watching. You have a great day.